All right, so you see my screen. Okay, great. Yes. Anyway, so we will start. Um, this is the, uh, the, the quick introduction of myself. I'm a, a, a lawyer and I'm also an um, employee consultant for ITG. And I have, uh, besides many years of legal experience, I also have uh, four ITG uh, certifications and I teach the GDPR and ISO 27000 courses. Um, Anyway, it's the ITG governance. This is basically what we do. Uh, it's sort of a, theoretically, it's a one-stop shop for IT governance and including uh, compliance. Now, today's agenda is we are going to talk about why um, organizations need to comply with the GDPR. And actually, this is a good time to talk about it because I am absolutely amazed how quickly the law in this area has, has changed over the last uh, week, shall we say. Not even, we're not even talking about a month, although that was a big one too. Okay, why the GDPR? First of all, in terms of the GDPR, the GDPR has, uh, has been around uh, not since May 25th, but it's basically been around since um, 1998. The prior law was the Data Protection Directive. So this law is basically has been in Europe. It wasn't as strong and there weren't the penalties. Uh, so we just didn't get the press that it does now, but it has been around for a very, very long time. Well, why do the Europeans even want to protect their privacy? You know, in America, we apparently don't need to protect privacy at all. Well, the reason is, again, historical. You have to remember that in Europe, uh, they basically were under uh, the, uh, basically the most of half of Europe was in the Iron Curtain. And uh, they were under, they were being watched continually by the local happy organization of the secret police. For example, in Germany, they had the Stasi, and the Stasi basically, uh, when they, when the Berlin Wall fell and they looked at the Stasi files, they determined that one out of three people in the entire country were informers. Now, if you have that type of history, you get pretty sensitive when people start looking at your stuff. So that is why the GDPR and the Data Protection Directive was created. However, that doesn't make that doesn't answer the simple question of why you should comply with it. Well, we will answer that and more. First of all, what's the GDPR about? Well, it is about cybersecurity and it is about privacy, but it's about something far more important. What the GDPR does is it defines property rights in your data. In other words, for example, uh, I always like to use the idea of a car. Uh, right now, let's say if my data was a car, you'd come take the car whenever you wanted. You could drive it as far as you wanted. You could sell it to anybody else. You could loan it out to anybody else. And I wouldn't have any say in that. And basically, what, what that situation would create a situation where you either didn't have or had very, very few property rights in the car. Well, that's the situation right now in, in for example, in the United States. We have very little property rights uh, in our data. However, under the GDPR, they have very nice, very wonderfully clean uh, definitions about how you can use property. That, and basically they say is that, yes, I can allow you to use my property. I can allow you to use my data, but only under certain circumstances. And that's basically what it's doing. Now, the thing is about the GDPR is this idea of cybersecurity, privacy, and property has become wildly popular, not just in Europe, where it's been for 20 years, but now it's going all around the world at lightning speed as more and more countries and more and more states pass similar types of laws. Now, in the United States, even without certain laws, we do have uh, a number of laws in the United States that require us to have certain, at least certain types of restrictions on how we use data. The usual one is breach notification. Um, but there are also sector regulations like HIPAA, you may have heard of that. There's also the New York Department of Financial Services, the SEC, uh, Securities Exchange Commission, government regulations. 
so that is the United States. However, since the last time I gave this uh, lecture, we also now have the California um, Consumer Privacy Act, which is due to go into a force as of January 1, 2020, in a mere like 18 months. So, and that has very similar but different uh, means of of protecting privacy. So, also these these very things, the number of laws out there has increased. Let me also you read you something else about the number of laws that they're increased. Um, for example, a recent article I just read in Asia, China, Singapore, Vietnam have introduced cybersecurity in laws. Indonesia, Japan, Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan have introduced uh, privacy and data protection laws. And on, on India, Hong Kong, Thailand are currently reviewing drafts. Uh, and this also has to do with Australian privacy laws are being looked at. So basically, if you're not preparing for this, you're behind thing. Now, uh, breach, materiality, that has to go with your stock. If you are a public company, right to privacy. Uh, the Hulk Hogan, uh, AKA Boleo, uh, just got an award of $114 million. So protecting privacy and protecting uh, information uh, in the United States so far, that has not been necessary, but that's changing uh, very radically. In fact, an hour ago, I read two laws, one in Colorado and one in Louisiana, where the data breach laws have been amended to state that the companies have to provide reasonable data security. So the security of data and cybersecurity is becoming uh, codified just about every other place in the world, except perhaps at the federal level of the United States. Uh, however, that's that said, this is a long list of all the regulations that do have something to do with how you deal with data. Unfortunately, in the United States, it's very confusing because as you see, we have an alphabet soup of different data types of, of data regulations. And that's an enormous problem. But each of these things has some issues and has some regulations that have to do with data projects. The challenge in the United States right now, and also if you're doing business in the United States and other countries, is to synchronize all this stuff, and so you can come up with a real, a real, um, you know, program. This has been enormously complicated by uh, the new California law, which has very similar types of things, but you have to um, tweet. Not to, to, whatever the word is, you have to uh, change your methods and programs slightly to make sure you can comply with both laws. This is an ongoing challenge and it changes on an incredibly fast basis. Now, um, how to comply? Well, there are various methods to comply. I, ha I work for a company, ITG, that was the first company that certified to a cybersecurity framework which is that at that time was a British standard and in 2005 it became the international standard. And uh, I, have, I have been introduced to this and I believe strongly that the only way to get good cybersecurity is to adopt a framework. In the United States, we have uh, the standards usually found in SOC 2 reports for public companies but that is, it has a problem because it's only auditing stuff that's in place. You're not looking at a, a standard. And the problem is that if you, you, if you don't look at, if you don't comply to a standard, you're not making sure that you have the best practices. And if you don't have the best practices, of course, you will be hacked by the very clever people out there who are trying to steal uh, enormous amounts of information. I can't remember what the hack du jour was, but I remember seeing something. Okay, these are the consequences of, uh, of non-compliance, is that you can get fines. Now, uh, that one thing I did see today was um, under the old law, the, uh, uh, the regulator for UK, the data protection regulator, the ICO, has made two fines. One, they've hit um, Facebook with the maximum fine that they could under the old law, 500,000 uh, pounds, and they just hit a, a company, another company in England, for 240,000 euros. So the fines are definitely going up. 
Um, and that's uh, that's a major problem now however if you do comply you have all sorts of other types of uh benefits that really have nothing to do with regulation my view is that the driving force of this should not be just because you you're worried about a regulation the driving force should be that you want a competitive advantage for your firm and for example, uh, I also read an article recently, speaking of competitive advantages, and this is from the chief executive of the GIC, which is the second largest investment fund in the world. So if you want your uh, stock and your company to be interest of others, this is what's required. GIC of the largest institutional investors in the world views cyber attacks as the biggest the biggest threat to its portfolio as the fund increased the proportion of nominal cash and bonds to the highest mark in the last five years to help minimize risk. My biggest worry is cybersecurity and how it hits different countries. For the kind of risk, I think we are pretty well prepared. Cyber is a hard one. In other words, if you don't have cybersecurity, you won't be able to get customers, you won't be able to get partners, and you won't be able to get investors. So it's not necessarily about the fines and, and legal compliance. It's basically about producing a better business. It's more attractive to everybody. OK, but we're going to talk about the GDPR. What does the GDPR uh, deal with? Well, there's a lot of people out there said, oh, well, no, the GDPR only deals with EU citizens. Uh, and it only deals with EU companies. Well, that's not true. For example, uh, the slide here shows this um, hotel in Kissimmee, Florida. Now, if this uh, motel or whatever it is, uh, advertises on the web and it advertises in German and it takes E and it takes euros, then it is subject to the jurisdiction of the GDPR. Also, Americans we we are not eu citizens of course but if we're in the eu for example or like me if i work for a company that's in the eu at least for now i get all the rights to the data processors so excuse me i get all the rights under the gdpr and for controllers or people like our hotel here who's tr who are trying to attract european um european visitors they are also subject to the gdpr now, um, also a little note on the California law, that is a little easier on uh, jurisdiction, but it usually does have anything to do with the California uh, subject, so I wouldn't apply for that. But if you do business in California and they make up 20% of the US economy and 12% of the um, of the population, it's sort of hard for you not to do business in California. So getting your 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 program right so you can um comply with these various laws and help your business is going to be a major challenge as we go forward okay um now the one great thing about the gdpr is that it is not it, we've all heard about the horrible fines. Well, I'm sure that there are a lot of certain, very certain companies, like they've already fined Facebook on the old law, and I'm sure there's somebody out there who's going to try to find them on the new law. Um, now, there's a special category. However, the European system of regulation is actually a lot better than the United States. I used to practice tax law, and under the tax law, there's not a lot of sympathy for the taxpayer. If you don't pay your taxes, you could be in trouble. However, under the GDPR, before you get fined, you have to go through all the mitigation factors. So, and there's a whole bunch of mitigation factors. Did you, was your cybersecurity, was your breach or whatever happened, or your breach of privacy intentional or negligent? In other words, are you like Facebook and you're out there making money? on selling other people's data, which is also a no-no. That brings you within the jurisdiction of the California law, by the way. There's also um, who's at fault in, in the European, the controller or processor, um, and could be at fault, and for breaches of cybersecurity, although the ultimate responsibility has to do with the controller. 
you know, have you screwed up before? If you if you have, you're obviously going to be subject to a larger fine. And this is also true in the United States. We just saw a Texas hospital uh, being fined under HIPAA uh, for $4.2 million because basically they would had numerous uh, infringements and they weren't following their own procedures. Uh, the degree of cooperation, how hard are you working to cooperate with the supervisory authorities? I would suggest you do so as much as possible. For example, I recently saw something about the fact people were worried about the fact that they would have to report a breach. Well, there's been so many breach reporting apparently in uh, the UK that the uh, regulator has said we're not taking phone calls anymore, just go fill out the form on our website. So yeah, it's this is this is not they're not trying to every breach or every violation is not trying not going to shut you down. It's not going to be subject to you to the maximum penalty. The whole point is to protect the data subject and to make sure that their privacy and their data is protected. So part of this is education. So this is not anything necessarily to be afraid of. You might be afraid of various things in the United States. Eventually, you're going to have to have this. And the better you and the better you do it, and the faster you do it, the better off you're going to be. Okay, Article 83. These are these are the um, the big fines for basically what I call Tier Two fines. They have to do with violations of your principles, and the principles there are six of them, and they basically have to do with um, if you when you use data, you can only use it lawfully, legitimately. Uh, you can only collect what you need. You, you have to make sure that it's accurate. You can't keep it forever. And the best and biggest one, of course, is you have to have cybersecurity. And then there are eight rights. The difference between principles and rights is that principles are absolute and rights are not. The other problem is transfers. You cannot transfer, you can, if you transfer uh, data, the European data subject outside of the EU without fitting in to one of the exceptions, you could be subject to the larger fine. So the larger fine is levied on violations of principles, rights, and transfers. And it could be, of course, 20 million or 4% of your global turnover. However, the problem is that this has changed a whole lot of the point about transfers, the higher fine, is basically what that has done. No one's been fined under it, but basically that's encouraged this long list of countries to pass their own cybersecurity and privacy laws so they can come within the definition and they can be approved by the EU as having adequate protection for data security, which means they don't need to come within one of the exceptions. They are already, they're already approved so uh, you can transfer data to them. Now, the United States, of course, being the outlier of this, uh, is sort of going the other way. So we are not approved, and so any and the old one of the methods of uh, protecting it, which is the agreement called the Privacy Shield, may be on its way out. But the whole point is because of the transfers that has provided an economic incentive for these laws to basically go viral and go global. Okay, um, these are the various methods of uh, oh, the attack vectors. The real problem with um, with worrying about whether or not you'll get fined on any of these laws really has to depend on on two types of, of, of questions. The, the question is whether or not the regulator is going to be interested. The regulators in almost every regulator throughout the world, with the possible exception of Germany and Austria, are not going to go in and audit you randomly unless you're a hospital. Um, they will normally show up uh if you've had a data breach so the real problem is that you have to make sure you have the highest level of cybersecurity because if you have a data breach then all sort all sorts of other laws will click in and it's not only uh the gdpr that requires you report a data breach it's also every state in the united states has one of these laws so no matter where you're doing business you still have to have a uh a program to deal with data breaches. Every the other thing is, as I just said, uh, said a little uh, few minutes earlier, is that 
some of these data breach laws are not only saying that you have to report data breaches, although usually not within 72 hours, it's usually like 30 days. They're also saying that you have to have take reasonable, reasonable measures of cybersecurity. So that is now part of the law. Uh, in the SEC, if you don't report a data breach immediately, you could be subject to a fine under uh, securities law, which is 10B5. You have to state uh, any change in material fact. If you don't, there was another company who didn't, I believe it was um, Equifax, just recently paid a fine of $40 million. Then, of course, PIPA has data breach laws, as does the NYDFS. So your main problem, if you get data breach, that means you're going to have to start reporting to just about everybody under the sun, and you have to make pretty sure you're ready for it. Uh, the best way to do it is, of course, avoid a data breach at all times, and usually there is a get out of regulation free, and car free card, which is called encryption. Uh, now, the other way you can get into trouble under the GDPR besides a data breach is you could have a complaint from a happy or unhappy, in this case, EU citizen. In this case, what they do is they file a uh, what's called a data subject access request or a DSAR or an SAR. And basically, the subject access request says, uh, what information do you have on me? and I want to see it, and some of it I might want to do something about. Or well, what information have you sold? Now, is this something that's just localized to the GDPR? Uh, not anymore, because there's almost an exact same right that now exists on the Cal, well, will exist in 18 months under the California Consumer Privacy Act. It also exists in, in laws in many other countries. So uh, in that case, if you have a data subject request and somebody uh, puts in the information and you don't provide it, then obviously the um, data subject will have an incentive to go complain to the regulator. If you provide the information uh, quickly and, and as much as you possibly can, um, then the, the data subject will have nothing to complain about. So they'll stay away. Now, most of, most uh, EU companies have been doing this for over 20 years, and some of them are quite good at it. And so they make their customers, and remember their data subjects are also their customers, they make their customers very happy by providing this service uh, relatively quickly. American companies, on the other hand, uh, at least from what my reading so far of Stonewalled, which is another reason why some of the larger ones will no doubt uh, be subject to a uh, rather impressive fine in the near future. Okay, now I talked about I talked about the principles: uh, lawful, uh, legitimate, adequate, accurate, stored, and security. Now, what are they? What are these? What does this all this mean? Well, lawful means, remember I talked about the car, you can't take my car unless you have a lawful basis for that. You can't take my data unless you have a lawful basis for it. If not, is if you take my car, it's called a grand theft auto. If you take my uh, data without my without being lawful, you won't get arrested, but you may have to be subject to a fine. What is lawful anyway? Well, that comes back to one of the six bases which you can probably use for. You probably used consent or heard about that. The other ones are, the big ones are contract, the government tells you to, or a very broad general one called legitimate. Okay, collected for a specific purpose. So in other words, you have to you do what you say, say what you do. Now, this is basically into a privacy notice. Now, the GDPR is very good about this. They tell you exactly what they want in your privacy notice to help you make sure you do what you, you know, say what you do and do what you say. Uh, how, and the other point about privacy notices is that that is required under the, there's certain privacy notice provisions under the California Act um, and there are also provisions under many state laws and other sector laws in the United States. So these type of privacy, also for your information, you may have been bombarded by these privacy notices. Uh, right now, there's most of them are basically, uh, shall we say, garbage. Uh, they are very long, and this is specifically prohibited 
by the GDPR. If you want to see a really good privacy notice, I suggest you go to the ITG website, go down to the bottom and click on privacy notice. And that's what it's supposed to look like. If you go to Google or Facebook and look at their privacy notices, uh, just remember that those privacy notices are now subject to litigation in the EU by various groups because very simply, they're really awful. So, uh, you, you know, they're, I, I, it's unbelievable to me that these people even bothered to write that garbage twice, but they have. Anyway, so legitimate means good privacy notes. So you say what you do, do what you say. Adequate, okay, don't collect information you don't need. If you, you know, you don't need to collect, you know, you don't need to watch people all the time just because you think that there's a market for that. If you're going to sell me a watch, you just need me, you know, I think people wear watches these days. If you, you um, just need to know my name and address and my, you know, bank account and my credit card numbers. It's not necessary. You don't know, need to know my birthday or my health information. Okay, accurate. You have to keep the, have to allow somebody to keep the information up to date. Now, most websites already do that. They usually have a profile and they allow the, the data subject to update their information themselves. Just don't you know, put things in the way and say they can't. That's not a bad, not a good thing. Store it only as long as necessary. This, I don't, you know, this is, is, sets a lot of people on edge who have tons of data and tapes, which I believe there's no problem with that because there's no probably legal way that anybody could figure that one out. But just remember that you are paying a lot of money to store information. And only like, and uh, there's the storage company called Iron Mountain has warehouses all over the place where tons of, literally thousands of tons of paper is stored. And of that, only 10% is ever retrieved. So people are paying a lot of money just to store stuff that no one's ever gonna look at. So the, this is a requirement under the GDPR, but it's far more important to say this is an expense. This will lower your costs, lower your regulatory exposure. Just think of how, what data you need to do your business. Uh, it has to be accurate, has to be adequate. Make sure it's accurate and only keep it for as long as it's true. The last one, of course, is that you have to have uh, cybersecurity. Now, this is obviously a good, important part of the GDPR. It's an important, if you borrow my data, you have to protect it. Uh, so if, you know, it's not yours, it's mine. So just, if you take my data, make sure you protect it. Again, this is uh, just popped up in numerous state laws. It's, it exists under all sorts of federal laws, and it's certainly part of the new California privacy law. So this ain't just the GDPR. Okay, uh, lawful basis. Remember I talked about the very slate. Basically, it comes down to four. Consent, contract, legal obligation, and legitimate interests. So those are the four bases you can count. Legal obligation means like the US government needs to uh, get information so they can do withholding. And so they tell employers to do that. Well, I don't have any choice on that, so that's my legal obligation. Consent and contract are probably clear, and then there's legitimate interest which does allow you to do things like direct marketing. And there are other types of, of things under that. But before you skate on that one, make sure you go in and look at the guidelines and look at the balancing test. <coughs> okay, there are two others which are, um, which have to do with, uh, with vital interest, which is usually in somebody who's dying and then the public interest which for the most part won't apply. However, if you come within those, of course, they are a good valid basis for lawful basis. Now, for example, look at, remember my car hypothet. Obviously, you can borrow my car if I give you consent, or you can borrow my car if I, we have a contract, or if, if you have a reasonable basis for doing that. But you can't do it if I don't, if you don't have that lawful basis. That's what this is basically all about. Okay, principle six. Uh, the great thing about um, about principle six and the cybersecurity and also the GDPR in general is is that is proportional. You don't if you let's say for example all the information you you got on your system is just names, addresses, and email addresses, which is sort of public information out there. You don't have to really worry about. You don't have to have get the best and 
highest level and the most most expensive cybersecurity program out there. The best way to do it, of course, is the easiest way to do it is with the ISO 27001 certification. The great thing about the ISO certifications is uh, about the whole ISO family is, first of all, it fits together like Legos. Like, so you've got a business continuity one, there's, they'll come out, they're coming out with a privacy one. Um, I think it's, um, uh, I forget which one it is, but um, so there's a whole bunch of other ones. The other thing about ISO is the, the GDPR itself says we will risk if you have certified, if you have a certification, then that's one of the mitigating factors. It won't prevent a fine, but it's one of the major mitigating factors which will help you avoid a fine. Um, and it, so it doesn't ensure absolute protection, but it basically makes damn sure that you're not the last gazelle in the herd. The other thing about ISO with all these other countries all of the world uh, passing their own cybersecurity laws, you're going to need an international standard. The problem with American things like NIST 53171, uh, NIST IR 7621, uh, the COBIT 5 uh, frameworks is you can't certify to them. So, and they're also very localized types of things. The, the benefit is that we now live in a very globalized world and sales, and remember that it, the uh, data goes across borders, laws are limited by them. So you, if you're going to protect your data, which you are required to do now under many laws, the best way to go is the most heavily recognized standard. Okay. Now, um, there are some little areas in here, uh, there's some hot, I call them hot data subjects, and these are protected specifically uh, under Article 9 of, uh, of the GDPR. Uh, there is an absolute prohibition from processing data on, on race, ethnic origin, you, that, that, that whole list, uh, unless you come within the exception. Now, um, the problem with this is that Article 9 is limited to the GDPR, but there are a whole bunches of state laws and definitely obviously the HIPAA regulations that have similar questions for what they call sensitive information, which is usually a defined uh, term under a lot of US state laws. Unfortunately, we do not have a federal law. That does not mean that there aren't federal laws that haven't been introduced. There have been several of them, it's just that they're not gonna get passed during the present uh, during the present legislation session under the Republicans, however, there is greater interest in that, and that even the Republicans are moving toward a, a general idea of regulation. Okay, uh, privacy of individuals. These are the eight different rights. Uh, right to be informed. Remember that goes back to your privacy notice. Right of access. That's also part of the California Act. Right to rect and change again, California. Erasure, a big, big part of the California law. Uh, restrict processing, data portability, and the right to object are sort of limited to the GDPR. Um, and automatic decision making, of course, is limited to the GDPR. But the top ones, those four, I think almost all of them are in the California law. Um, and they also, of course, in certain sector laws. So these are things that you're going to have to have programs to make sure that you can satisfy these requests from your data subjects. Uh, privacy notice, again, say what you do, do what you say. If you are direct marketing, are you selling my data? Under the California law, uh, you have to have a big red button. If you're selling anybody's data, you've got a big, you have to have, your website has to have a big red button. And the big red button is if you punch it, that means you can't sell the data. So it's probably a good idea to find out if that's what you that that's part of your business model and decide how you're going to deal with it. But if the one thing you have to do is that if you are doing this, you have to make sure that it finds its way into the privacy notice. The other point is um, under the United States, we do have a federal law. It's been around since 1914, and that's the Federal Trade Act, and that requires that. That requires that if you say something on your privacy notice, you have to make sure you're doing it. Both Google and Facebook are under FTC consent degrees, and there is some question about whether or not they violated them, which could be, I think, the, the current 
fine is $47,000 per person. And, you know, so that, that could get very expensive for any of those companies. Uh, and the, all, the other problem is the, all these silly privacy notices that you've been seeing lately, they, they just serve an invitation to have problems because many of them just go long, way long, farther than they possibly could. So there's probably something in there that the FTC eventually could find unfair and deceptive. I mean, if you write a 40 page document, there's something in there that you're not telling the truth. So this is this is gonna be a problem, not only for people trying to comply with the GDPR, trying to comply with the United States. Okay, um, these are the various ways you exercise your rights. Uh, and if you wanna avoid article eight, the tier one fines, the 2% and 10 million euros, um, you have to respond to these things. Again, for a subject access request, you have 30 days. Uh, again, um, that subject access request does exist now in the California law. Uh, the erasure, of course, does exist in California. Uh, and then the other three are limited to uh, Europe, but you're still going to have to have the processes if you do business there. Now, controllers and processor, what this does is it sort of reallocates the liability. You notice that on the left hand, the right hand side of the screen, or you got data processors, and the left hand you got data subjects. Please note that there's no arrow going directly from the data subject to the data processors. Everything has to go through the data controller. So if you if you're a data processor and you have a breach, your obligation is to just inform the data controller. The data controller's obligation is to um, is to inform the data subject if necessary and to form the supervisory authority. The whole point is that the relationship between the data processor and the data controller has to be set out in a very specific contract. The one example of the contract is called the Slalom Project. It's an EU project for a cloud contract. And that is, it's, it's been drafted by a UK law firm. Uh, and it has, it's a template if you want to take a look at that. Uh, the other point about processors and controllers is that they have now joint and several liability, which could be a major problem for many cloud companies um, if they have a data controller that goes belly up and they might be stuck with the entire cost, even though the data controller might be the one who's negligent. The best way to transfer this liability, uh, of course, is through your contracts. So make sure you review your contracts between your data processors and your data controllers to make sure that you comply with these things. And again, don't just sign the contract and leave it there. You probably need a, a contract management system to make sure you're complying with every country and every state that you do business in. And these, of course, change rapidly. OK, uh, <clears throat> one of the things that all of these regulations require is documentation. The example of uh, I give you of the GDPR uses the word documentation 22 times. And this is true in, um, for example, the Office of Civil Rights is charged with, um, in, with HIPAA enforcement. And the Texas hospital got whacked with that $4 million fine because not only well, they did have policies and procedures, they just never bothered to follow them. Uh, and they never bothered to enforce them. That's one of the benefits of uh, these frameworks, specifically ISO 27001, is the you're required to audit. And so you have to make sure not only that you have the framework in place, but you are auditing your process. But what's going to happen is when the regulators come in, they're not going to want to see how well you configure your firewall. They're going to want to see what sort of procedures you have and whether or not you have evidence of actually uh, following them. All right. One of the, the heart of the of the GDPR is your um, the heart of your GDPR is your uh, data inventory. You've got to know what data you have, what do you do with it, how long you keep it, whether you can give it back, is it sensitive information, all that wonderful stuff. The best way to do that is to uh, do a data flow mapping. Find out who gets the data, then where does it go, and you know you have to go through the whole process to make sure that you know that you have it legally and that during the entire uh, time that you have the data, uh, from the time either it, it gets destroyed, the time you take it in, the time it gets destroyed, 
or given back or whatever, you have the appropriate cyber cybersecurity controls. The best way to do that, of course, is to do, do a data inventory flow mapping. Uh, the illustration on the screen is uh, IKG's product. I'm sure there might be other ones out there. I'm rather fond of that one because uh, I think it, it, uh, it, what it does is it also creates a list and so you know what categories. So the thing about the GDPR is the whole thing fits together very well and you keep seeing the same language repeat over and over and over again. So you have, if you comply with one area, you comply with another area. And this is one area doing a data inventory helps you comply with another requirement, Article 30 under the GDPR, which states that you have to list, you have to state what categories you're processing data. Okay, uh, transfers, we talked a little bit about, about this earlier. These are the exceptions. You can come with adequacy. Now there's a whole lot of countries out there that are working very far hard to come under that standard. A lot of those countries in Asia I listed because why? They want to do business with Europe. They're trying to make sure that they're, they are adequate. Um, another way, to, the quick and dirty way to use the standard contract clause. The only problem with that is you might have to have a lot of them. If you're a larger company with a whole lot of subsidiaries, you might want to use binding corporate rules, but they are expensive and it takes uh, a year to uh, basically get them approved. Consent is also possible. There's of course the, the, the infamous privacy shield, uh, which uh, may get, they has, has to be approved every year. It's up for approval in, in September by the European Commission, the executive branch of the EU government, but the parliament has basically said, uh, no way, Jose, the United States hasn't complied with anything. You have either the United States complies or you get rid of the privacy shield. Uh, even if they approve it for another year, there are already cases in court and the probability is that the European Court of Justice will throw it out. So the better chance, the better idea is rather than try to rely on the privacy shield is to make sure that you have your own privacy and cybersecurity frameworks in place. So you don't have to worry about just the privacy shield. You have to worry about, you know, global and actually now U.S. Uh, cybersecurity and privacy laws. Okay, <clears throat> now how is, what, I sometimes I get all these questions about supervisory authorities and how they're going to enforce it. Well, the GDPR, unlike um, a lot of American laws, is very, very good on enforcement. You can, you can enforce it by, uh, somebody can enforce their rights by complaining um, or by suing. And you can sue either the controller or the processor, or you can even sue the supervisory authority. It's like suing an attorney general in the United States. So basically, and also the way that they supervisory authorities can uh, support their action is they can either order, they can order a, uh, they can order the, the firm that is not doing things right to do it correctly. Um, they can get a court to order the action. Um, or they can, and the other thing, type of thing is these supervisory authorities not only can collect fines, but they also have injunctive powers. So they, for example, could say, well, uh, you're not doing this right, so we're not going to allow you to transfer any data across, uh, across the Atlantic, which actually could be a larger problem than, uh, you know, straight sort of fine. So they have injunctive types of things. The other point is that data subjects have the right to sue the data controller or data processor directly. We talked about that. The, that's called a, that's called a um, right of private action. That exists also in the United States. There are 17 states that allow for um, people who've lost their data uh, in, a, in a breach to sue the companies. Uh, there's a whole bunch of others that, of course, do not, but they you, that is possible. Uh, in the US. It's less of a problem because the EU doesn't have contingency fees or class actions. Um, these are the type of compliance issues I usually see. For example, usually the problems have to do with an American company that has a EU, EU subsidiary, uh, their employees are data subjects, they have E2 EU retail customers, B2B contracts also have issues, but not as many. Uh, quite often we're seeing a whole lot of um, Companies comply with become GDPR compliant for competitive uh, competitive advantage. 
um, or they're getting ISO because their partners require it. And um, the, make sure there are easy ways to do it. Make sure you have the SAR and your privacy notices. Don't look at the low level ones you see in the United States. Those are being under lawsuit right now. Uh, but those are the main issues you have to worry about for United States um, companies. Okay, here are the quick and dirty ways to uh, comply. Uh, 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 obviously, you have to come up with a framework, uh, decide what the scope of your project is, and remember the GDPR scope and cybersecurity scope are different. Uh, the, the heart of it is conduct a data inventory, which is always important and will become more important when the California law clicks in. Come up with the policies, procedures, make sure you communicate. And then the, the most important part of any of this is monitoring and auditing. So you have to make sure that you are constantly looking, make sure that people are doing what they say they are doing in order to make sure that you have the most robust uh, cybersecurity um, plan. And so that you will support your business on this and regu regulation. But the whole point again is to make sure that uh, you have your competitive advantage and your business continues to go rather than concerning yourself uh, with cybersecurity just because a regulation tells you to, although there's that as well. Okay, um, these are, now a word from our sponsors, these are various types of things um, that uh, we, uh, that we sell in order to help your compliance. The GDPR ED, EU Privacy Shield and Pocket Guide, uh, I am in the process of writing the chapter on the California uh, consumer privacy law for that one. So that will that, that will come out hopefully fairly soon. Uh, and also we give all sorts of EU GDPR foundation, uh, my favorite course and the practitioner course for those of you who need a deep dive. Uh, the gap analysis is for to find out whether or not you comply. We sit down with you. That's a one on one consulting type of thing. There is also another program that you get an hour or two of talking to somebody like me um, and I go over what you're doing and hopefully solve your problems. Uh, or maybe, in fact, the better news quite often is that you don't have any problems. Okay, there we go. Finished on time. Uh, let me see if we have any questions. And you feel free now to uh, type any questions that you may have. Okay, well, good. I don't see any questions right now. So, um, to go on a little, make one more point. Let me also, uh, since I have some time, uh, let me read you something which you might find rather interesting. Uh, this is a quote, and it's a quote from a regulator. While an organization may have data protection policies and practices in place, it's equally pertinent that these policies are clearly documented. If an organization's policies and practices are not clearly documented and is simply a corporate practice tradition through custom verbal instructions, it would inevitably be difficult to demonstrate compliance um, with the law. These cases, okay. Now, where did that quote come? Was it a European supervisory authority? No, actually, it was from the Singapore. Uh, supervisory authority they're the, the personal data protection commission and they and they are operating under the personal data protection act of 2012 for singapore and they were actually questioning a, a facebook or another large company no they were actually questioning a hairdresser and a moving company so the point of that of all these the, the, the that quotation and some of the others i have read throughout the presentation of this webinar have to do with the fact that this type of requirement for your business is um, it's truly everywhere these days. It's not just the GDPR. It's not just uh, you know people who do business in Europe. It is pre people who do business in, in uh, California. It's people who do business in Singapore. It's people who 
do business in Australia. Um, even uh, Brazil actually has a new law that they are are coming in and, and determining whether or not they are they're going to comply. The reason that Brazil is getting it because it, once again they have a lot of trade with Europe and they're trying to make sure that they are adequate. So that is uh, the reason basically why this is required. Again, you have to make sure that you watch this space because the regulatory environment surrounding cybersecurity is changing very, very rapidly and it's changing all the time. So uh, it is absolutely necessary that you consider this and make sure that it's part of your business plan. And oh, wait a minute, what's happening there? Okay, uh, reside in North America, I host a uh, my own website, and it is not famous. There are hardly some hits on my website. What if an EU citizen during a good search land up uh, accessing my website? Okay, with well, basic information. Do I need to comply with the GDPR? No, you do. You, you do not have to comply with GDPR. Uh, remember, I talked about the hotel in Kissimmee, Florida. If the hotel in Kissimmee, Florida is actively uh trying to uh do business and attract europeans uh then they have to be subject to gdpr well how do you do that well one good way is to use a language that europeans speak like german french or spanish so if your website is or can be translated in any one of those languages and if you also take european money i.e euros um then you would definitely be subject to the gdpr but uh, remember, laws are limited by borders. That is not. So they cannot subject you jurisdiction if you're not uh, actively trying to attract European. So if your website is just in English and you just take money in dollars, no, the Europeans are, are not interested in you. Uh, if you uh, the, the, the California regulator might be if you if you have a website in English and you are come within their jurisdictions. Fortunately, they, they, there are uh, small businesses uh, cutoffs. You have to be like have $25 million or uh, be in the business of brokering data or uh, you have to have $50,000, 50,000 data subjects before you come within the jurisdiction of that. But as to the Europeans, the answer is no. What if we are a U.S. based hospital and you EU citizens come through uh, the EDR? No, you're not subject. There, no. If like, yeah. If if uh, if you have you know, if you don't advertise, let's say for example, you have a website. Uh, it's in French, and you encourage people that have emergencies in. Let's say you're in Florida, and you see a lot, or in New York and you have advertised somewhere that you're encouraging Europeans to come to your hospital, uh, yeah, then you might have a problem. But just a random European, you know, coming through the doors because they've been an, an offender bender will not subject you to the GDPR. That's, that's not one of your issues at all. You have much harder issues to comply with in terms of, in terms of HIPAA. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't really worry about the GDPR uh, unless you are, uh, that is part of your, um, your, your business model. Say, for example, your concierge healthcare provider, and you're specifically catering to um, wildly rich Europeans when they are in the United States. In that case, you may have that issue, but uh, for most businesses that just have a, a like the, your hotel in florida and the european stops by that doesn't automatically subject you to the um to the jurisdiction of the gdpr let's see we've got anybody else businesses or no or no transactions made with the users in terms of money uh no, the, the law says it doesn't matter whether or not you take money or not. Uh, if you are if you are targeting EU citizens in such a way, um, then whether or not they they actually pay you doesn't really make much difference. The question is whether or not you are actually trying to attract them uh, by 
you know, like providing stuff that they, they specifically might want or providing advertising materials in their particular language or taking money. Are you, or the other way, of course, the easy way to do it is to have a, um, have an, an employee or a business unit in the EU itself. But taking money is not the, is, is not the trigger. The trigger is whether or not you actually are trying to attract um, EU customers. So you don't get it all. Okay, no, I think I got all the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, that's the end of the hour. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and uh, good luck with your uh, uh, compliance projects. And hopefully, be aware that. Uh, this is not something that ended on right now or ends with the GDPR. This is uh, this is the wave of the future, uh, and in many many countries, it's already here and will eventually come, and will be in the United States in a very big way, at least in 18 months. And my bet, uh, probably a lot sooner, as the law as if if the political situation in Congress changes. So anyway, thank you very much for, for coming, uh, and I hope it has been reasonably informative, and I apologize for any uh, technical glitches. Okay, thank you.